Hey everybody, Aaron here. For those of you that don't know me, I've been a lineman on the east coast of Canada for about 15 years now. What I've got for you here today is a little video talking about amperage. I made this video because whenever I hear of people receiving minor electrocutions, they sometimes ask, well how much amperage is on the line? It's the amperage that kills, right? I try to explain to them that it doesn't really matter how much amperage is on the line, and that the statement it isn't the voltage that kills, it's the current, is easily misunderstood. In fact, a line may have zero amperage on it, but that doesn't mean you can touch it. It just means that it's isolated, or that the circuit isn't yet complete. Touching a line with no amperage, in most cases, will create a path and create electricity flow. That being said, if you do have a complete circuit with hundreds of amps on it, and you do touch it, a very small fraction of that amperage will actually pass through you. How small? Well, if you Google how much current is dangerous, it states that any amount of current over one one hundredth of an amp is capable of producing a painful shock, while one tenth of an amp is enough to kill. Rather than trying to explain this any further, I'm just going to try and show you. Throughout the video, I'll try and keep explanations as simple as possible and use terminology that most everyone can understand. If you do understand the basics of an electrical circuit, however, it'll definitely make things easier. So what I'm doing here is I'm actually making a small extension cord with some wire and a couple plugs, and I'm exposing the wires to make it so that I can read the amperage on each individual wire as we go through with this experiment. Throughout this video, I'll be using 120 volts mainly because it's a little safer to work with and is standard within North America for most households. I don't recommend, however, trying any of these experiments, as 120 volts is still enough to produce a lethal shock. So what you're looking at right now is a green wire, that's your ground, the black wire, that's your live wire, and your neutral. So the first thing we need, obviously, is something to plug into the wires. Generally speaking, any electronic that generates a lot of heat draws a lot of load. So I figured I'd try this hair straightener. It's fairly small and it gets pretty hot. But unfortunately when I use my multimeter and clip onto an individual wire to see exactly how much current it's drawing, it's only using about 1.8 amps. Which for this experiment, the more amperage I can get the better. So let's find something else. So I figured we'd try my toaster. You can see it on the floor there in the bottom left. So I clip on my ammeter onto the one live wire, turn on one side at a time, and we got 6 amps, now 12 amps. That's much better. So 12 amps at 120 volts, that's about 1500 watts. So the first thing I'm going to show you is extremely important. Now what I'm clipped onto here isn't actually the live wire, it's the neutral wire. And as you can see, we're still conducting the entire 12 amps, same as live wire. I'm not going to get into why that is, but it's important that you know the neutral wire is just as dangerous as the live wires. So what I'm doing now is creating a parallel path within the circuit. Have you ever heard the saying that electricity takes the path of least resistance? Well, that's simply not true. Electricity takes all paths. Basically, what you're looking at here the longer wire is going to have more resistance than the shorter wire. So let's see how the current reacts. So as you can see, the longer, more resistive path is still taking 2.5 amps, while the shorter path is taking the majority 9 amps, for a total of about 12.8 amps. As we all know, current also creates heat. So now that we've doubled up the live side of the wires, you can see they're much cooler than the neutral wire that's taken the full 12 amps. That's why I'm not a big fan of those plug-in heaters. They draw way too much load for the size wire for long periods of time. And just for curiosity, I wonder how much heat's coming out of that 120 volt toaster. So what I'm going to do next is modify the circuit so that we can try and simulate a low voltage electrocution. For sake of arguments, we're going to use the shorter path, the one that was the path of least resistance earlier. Before we move on, I do want to quickly show you how a simple connection can greatly influence the performance of a system. 
Touching the wires together will still create a path, but it is in no means a good connection. And although it is the shorter path, it now has a higher resistance, and will only carry about 3 amps, where the remaining 9 will now divert to the longer wire. So what happens if a person becomes part of the circuit? I'm going to use a hot dog to show you, as it can be considered similar in consistency with the conductivity of our skin. Now, remember how I said the amperage in the circuit doesn't really matter? Well, you can see here, now that although the hot dog is being used essentially as a conductor, its resistance is so high that all 12 amps are flowing through the longer wire, leaving only 0.1 of an amp to go through the hot dog itself. This is where we get these low but fatal numbers, as the 0.1 of an amp, if inducted directly across your heart, would be fatal. Now what happens if we remove the bypass wire and put all the load directly through the hot dog? Well, we're getting zero amps. Really the amperage should be about the same as our last readings, but the problem here is the hot dog just isn't conductive enough to even allow the toaster to turn on. So how can we really get some current to flow through that hot dog? Let's rewire things again here. This time, rather than trying to feed a 12 amp toaster, we're going to put the hot dog directly in the path between the live wire and the ground. Now simply doing this with wires, the current would instantaneously spike so high that my breakers would trip, before even having a chance to read it. The hot dog, however, should introduce enough of a resistance to read what should be the maximum amount of amperage the hot dog itself will allow to pass through at 120 volts. With the hot dog in place, I install once again the clip on amp meter. Turn the power on and 0.75 amps, way more than enough to do serious damage to a person. Now one of the biggest factors here is the distance the electricity must travel through the hot dog. The further it must travel, the higher resistance will become, and lowering the amperage. In other words, if I were standing on the white wire while holding the black in my hand, the actual amperage reduced to approximately 0.01 of an amp, and as you decrease the distance, that amperage will go up. I'll show you what I mean in a minute, and no I'm not going to try it out on a real person. And if you didn't notice a moment ago, the smoke rising from the hot dog, that's because the electricity is actually cooking the hot dog. One amp is more than enough to actually cook the meat inside the hot dog. That's what's happening to your muscles when you're getting electrocuted. So in a moment you'll see where I put the wires a little closer together to really try and spike the current going through the hot dog. But what was happening is it was cooking it so fast that it was actually burning the tips off the wires and then breaking the contact within the hot dog itself. So what I did next was clean off the wire and try again, but this time with a little bit of pressure on the wire. I was able to maintain contact and simulate what was an all too real look at what a high voltage electrocution would look like. Yeah, I'm done now there, young fella. I think you've waited long enough too, eh, ghost? Well, that's all I got for you today. Don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel for many more videos about electricity and power lines and other things I find interesting.